Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. Welcome again to another edition of the Nonprofit Exchange. This is where we have guests who share their expertise and it's exchange of ideas, best practices, stories. And today we're talking about a topic that's near and dear to our hearts. And um, my guest today is a, a dear friend who I've not seen in a long time, but uh, we talk occasionally. Uh, Mark S.A. Smith, welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange, Mark. Thank you, Hugh. It's a delight to be invited back to share some of the things I've learned along the way. And you're right, we don't see or talk to each other nearly enough, but we can fix that easily. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, so people are going to wonder why you got two initials in the middle of Mark and Smith. There's lots of Mark Smiths, huh? There are a lot of Mark Smiths. And if you, if you Google Mark Smith, you'll never find me. But if you go Google Mark S. A. Smith, it'll pop right up with all the stuff that I've written over the past 30 years or so. How many years? 30. Oh, my word. I've been doing my work 32, so you're catching up. Um, I, I am catching up quickly. <laughs> right. Our topic today is leadership skills and specifically leader skill, skills, leadership skills that will help you advance in your career. And we'll talk more about um, leadership and some of those dynamics. But first, uh, people want to know who is this Mark S.A. Smith. So tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, and why is it that you're doing what you're doing now? All right. I love it. I like that. So I am a business growth strategist. I help executives figure out how to plot the path how to set the goals, and then create the systems that allow them to reliably achieve those goals. And I have done this for, uh, uh, as a consultant and coach for 29 years. Along the way, I've written 14 books. A few of those are sitting behind me here. And um, also uh, have developed a number of uh, classes and seminars, coaching strategies and consulting packages that help people to achieve those goals. And one of the things that makes me unique in the world of coaching and consulting is I guarantee outcome. Well, you don't just take the money and too bad you didn't do your part. That's, that's a pretty gracious offer. Um, so Mark is our guest on uh, the nonprofit exchange today. We very commonly invite people that work in the business sector who understand business principles and understand why we need to embed those principles into the tax exempt business that we run. So um, we're running a business. We have more rules when we have to uh, do it in the context of uh, the nonprofit tax status, the tax exempt status, but really leadership is leadership. So your, your title today is um, leadership skills that will help you get a job or get advanced in your job. So what's, what's, what's the point of this? What's behind that title? Oh, yes, indeed. What's well, you know, leadership skills that get, get you, leadership skills that get you hired and promoted. And yes, Hugh, as you like to point out, um, tax exempt is merely a tax status, not a business plan. Nonprofit is not a business plan. And so I, I think it's important for us to understand that running a nonprofit is the same as running any other business. The difference is, what your stakeholders expect for you to deliver. In a profit organization, your stakeholders expect for you to return some money on their investment. And in, an, in a nonprofit, your stakeholders expect for you to deliver some different outcome that's equally as measurable for their investment. It just happens to not usually be money, but it doesn't mean that you can't make so much money that's embarrassing as a nonprofit. And money is one way that we keep score of how we're generating value for our constituents, for our donors, for those that keep us alive. And in that business environment, the reality is the only way you make real money in a career is by getting promoted. You know, otherwise you get that, you know, one or two or 3% raise per year, which really doesn't do much for you. 
So if you really want to grow your career, you have to exhibit leadership skills. And if you think about this, Hugh, if you take a look at the world of business and nonprofits, who gets paid the most? People who um, are successful. And where are they in the organization? They're usually at the top. That's right. The people at the top of the organization get paid the most. And that's a, almost a universal truism. And if they're not being paid the most, it's because somebody decided to do their job for a dollar. And so they're giving back their entire pay to, to some other location. But that said, the reason why you want to exhibit leadership skills is because when leaders are looking for people to hire, they want people that they can promote. Leadership succession is one of the biggest challenges facing all organizations today. And I'm sure that you run across that on a regular basis. Um, I, yeah, yes. I, I, yes. And can I say yes? <laughs> <laughs> and what that means is that if there's a problem with su succession and leadership, it, what it means is that they haven't been hiring for promotability. And then they haven't put those people on a career track, which allows them to grow into their role as a leader. So if you can indeed illustrate that you have leadership skills, you are more hireable than those who cannot. And the thing to keep in mind is that strategy, which is directing resources, is always more valuable than tactics, which is performing tasks. Well, let's make that differentiation again. Strategy, and, and yes. directing resources and tactics are performing tasks. You know, that's very, a very quantifiable explanation, which I have not heard before. Um, and we have, you know, we are in the nonprofit sector, social entrepreneurs. We have all the benefits and the liabilities of the shiny object syndrome and the lack of discipline and oh we got <laughs> we got ideas surely it'll work people will help us they'll give it they'll buy our product or give us money when and then we start implementing all of these tactics and as uh, our friend ed bogle says it's tactics in the absence of an overall strategy so give us those are some good sound bites how about repeating those again for the, the old brain like mine I'll be glad to do that. Strategy, which is directing resources, is always more valuable than tactics, which are performing tasks. Well, and what Center Vision fits into this mold is it's the integration of strategy and performance. Indeed. And as you know, I spent a career as a musical conductor. Mm -hmm. And our strategy is written down on what's called, um, it's a piece of paper, like your strategic plan. It's a piece of paper. Basically, you got a piece of paper with ink on it. And so what a conductor does is it integrates that piece into this performance. And what a leader sure. does is takes that, that document and integrates it into the team performance. So you really, you really have a direction and a, and a roadmap, per se, to implement the strategy. So there's an integration of those two. So we're doing all these tactical things and maybe we're doing so many things that they're getting in each other's way and canceling each other out. Well, I, the, the issue is direction. And as a conductor, you provide direction. So Hugh, an orchestra conductor can play every instrument in the orchestra, can't you? No, no. But not well enough to make a living playing any particular instrument. Well, we, we um, Typically, conductor understands how the instruments play, but we don't. No, that's them. right. We don't play them, but we understand how they function. But we don't tell people how to play them. We tell that's them right. the results we want. That's right. That's exactly right. And and what and you as the conductor knows the score, and the score is the objective and the strategy of the organization. And so your job is to conduct the various. Um, musicians to play together to cause the audience to rise to their feet in glorious applause at the end with their hearts moved and their minds refreshed. 
And somebody has to take on the leadership to do that. And the individual scores are the tactics and the score sheet you have in front of you is the strategy. If you want to take a look at a metaphor to pull all those various things together. So that's the difference between directing resources and performing tasks or directing the orchestra versus performing a particular solo. And you know, that's my analogy. We have the score, which is equal to the strategic plan. Each, each musician or singer has their own part, which is the action plan for that, that team member. And then right. what Dr. does is we set the pace, the tempo, we balance what needs to be out. Yeah. I'll go too fast, slow down, it's too loud, you know, back off. So we help people adjust to the, the whole. We call it, we call it building an ensemble. In right. in business, it's or yes. in, in non-musical terms, it's the synergy of our of our common vision, like center vision. Da. That, indeed. Beautiful. All right. So Let's lay down some more of these leadership principles. I like it. Well, number one, promotion only comes when you illustrate that you can do the next level job. Because what got you the job won't get you promoted. So you have to illustrate the fact that you can lead your peers if you're going to be promoted. <laughs> All right, so we got that one figured out. That's pretty straightforward. So you don't get promoted because you have seniority. You get promoted because you can lead the team. So that's where your leadership skills become really important. Next is you are promoted when you consistently make good decisions. And there is no way that a boss will promote somebody that's going to embarrass them or embarrass their boss. So a promotion chain goes up the food chain. And you have to illustrate good decision-making skills all the way up. And the reason why is because if your boss promotes you and you embarrass them and their boss, then your boss's boss is going to say, you don't make good decisions, therefore you're unpromotable. So there's this whole chain of observing every decision and every behavior that impacts promotability. Well, and I think- And then it's really, yep. Carry I on. think there's a, there's a, um, sorry to interrupt there. It's all well, all is well. There's a decision about the previous point, which is leadership. And the decision is what do you take off your plate and how do you, how do you lead the team rather than doing it yourself? So there's several layers of the decision making piece because you, if you're seen as a person who gets more results in a more effective manner, then you're actually worth more. Well, it's, that could be the case, yet a good leader identifies a person's ability to engineer systems to get things done. And there is a, a strategy that we have to look at when it comes to offloading things off your plate. And I've got a whole program just on that executive delegation without losing control. We probably would, might want to do that sometime. And the, prince, the fundamental principle is you look at the tasks that you are performing as a leader and you decide, is this an unskilled task, a semi-skilled task, a, or a skilled task, or a strategic task? And so uh, an unskilled task is one that you can hand to somebody with a checklist and they'll get the job done. That's washing windows, doing dishes, simple tasks. And it's easy to tell the quality control and a person with um, low to average IQ can probably get the job done. Then you have a semi-skilled person. That's where you, get, you need to have a certain level of skill. So things like building spreadsheets or taking memos or um, creating a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and then there's skilled. And skilled is where somebody has a certificate or they make a career out of it. That would be things such as marketing or sales. And you can outsource that frequently for less than you can bring it in-house unless you're, the flow of, of demand is high enough to bring it in-house. And then there's strategic, and that you as the leader are responsible for that. So 
this idea of what do you offload is really driven by the level of skill that's required. And you have zero business doing anything that's unskilled, semi-skilled or skilled. That needs to be in somebody else's hands. And if you want to promote somebody that has some skills, then you've got to document their process and create a system that takes their knowledge and turns it into a procedure that can then be handed off to somebody else. It's what happens when that skilled person gets run over by a bus or decides to retire or gets married and moves out of town. Uh, you know, all those things happen. <laughs> yeah, we always blame the bus, don't we? Well, the bus is an easy one, although I don't know anybody that's been hit by a bus. So. Well, those are all the people that wanted your job. <laughs> the bus. <laughs> that's being thrown under the bus, that's for sure. Well, we do use the bus analogy a lot. You know, the right seat on the right bus. We yeah. Get by bus, we get thrown under the bus. Mm -hmm. um, just never, never thought about some of those things we say. We never think about why we say them. Um, but you, um, this is really good stuff. So there's lots of dynamics to leadership. So let's let's pause here a minute. There's really good point so the what is in your in your experience what is the biggest misunderstanding or misinterpretation of what leadership means all right uh it's it's twofold um one is that there are so many styles of leadership out there that a lot of time people cabbage onto a particular style and declare that that's leadership. When it's not, it's just a style of leadership. And leadership style is driven by the objectives of the organization. And we can talk about some of those elements that set, the, set it in just a moment. So that's the first thing that I see go wrong. And people believe that you need to be an autocratic leader or a bureaucratic leader or a servant leader or a visionary leader or a transactional leader. And the reality is it depends on the objective of the organization, period. Hmm. So the second thing is what is the role of a leader? And a leader's role specifically is to efficiently direct the available capital, people, and technology and systems to achieve a desired outcome and take responsibility and accountability for those results. Wow, wish I'd said that. Well, you're welcome to say it anytime you like. <laughs> Mark Finsay Smith is very active on Twitter. <laughs> and, and you're well read. You quote lots of books. You you read lots of books. You talk about lots of books. You have your own quotes. So yes. you have um, quite a wealth of stuff on your on your Twitter feed. Thank so you. that's really helpful. I, I think the fundamental issue is people don't understand leadership and don't embrace any style except the, the boss. Uh, the boss is double S O B spelled backwards. Right on. You know, it does not work in today's culture. It worked at one point in history, but not today. All right. Well, I, I actually, I'll, I'll actually uh, debate you on that, Hugh. There are, there are organizations that require a bureaucratic autocratic leader. You're right. You are so and, right. And they're usually not, nonprofits, but they can be. Here's, here's the reason why, is if you have a highly regulated industry, bureaucratic leadership enforces the rules at the cost of a human being. So there's all carrot, uh, all stick and no carrot. But in, in that highly regulated industry, that's what's required to maintain the organization. Now, that said, it doesn't work if if the nonprofit is primarily volunteer organization. If you have an at-will relationship, bureaucratic behavior will usually destroy an organization. But what I want to point out is that as a leader, we have to understand that, that there is no wrong style given the context. There's, there is a more effective style. Mm -hmm. But every organization has to be looked at on their objectives and how their success is judged. And within that context, we choose a style for the current leadership challenge that we're facing. And it's authentic to who we are. Oh, indeed. And if you're not an authentic bureaucratic leader, don't do that. <laughs> you could not do that. So you're, that's well put. So 
you were checking off a list. Let's let's review the ones, the headers of those, and then let you go uninterrupted to the next one. So All what were the well. points so far? Well, just to recap, leaders efficiently direct the available capital, people, technology, and systems to achieve a desired outcome and take responsibility and accountability for those results. So that's, that's my first definition of a leader. Mm -hmm. I have an alternate definition of a leader, which may apply better for our listeners and our viewer, and that is a leader allows their team to be the best version of themselves as possible in this moment. Wow. Yeah, it's, that one implies that we get a good team, they know where we're going, we've done the strategy, you provide the resource, and you get out of the way. That's that right. allow is very revealing. That's, that's exactly right. Now, here's one of my favorites. Innovative leaders create a future that does not yet exist using methods that have not yet been invented with best practices that have not yet been established. Whoa. Let's throw, throw out some of these sound bites. These are very, very good. So are these attributed to Mark S.A. Smith? These are all Mark S.A. Smith originals. Well, I'm impressed. I knew you, <laughs> I knew well, you, you know me, Hugh. You know that I, my brain never shuts off around this stuff. This is my passion is to help business leaders figure out how to articulate their visions and their goals and their systems. I see. Yes. So the thing that's important to understand is that a leader does not look at today to judge the future. In fact, you'll find visionary and innovative leaders completely ignore the current circumstances and instead talk aspirationally about the vision they see being put into play. And what that means is they know, based on their experience, that the answers will show up, the technology will be developed, the team will appear the money will flood in if they can articulate their vision of the future and the value to those who they choose to serve. And then we'll invent those methods and we will establish best practices. But we don't need the methods, we don't need a how, and we don't need a best practice to drive into the future. Absolutely, we, we, make, it, we make it work and we, we actually, if you look at the work of Napoleon Hill, when he interviewed those 500 really powerful leaders in America, yes, last, was it the last century? Um, or maybe it was old past that, 1930s, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, they had a clear vision of the future. And like Thomas Edison, he knew he could invent the light bulb. It took him 10,000 tries. He knew he could do it, uh, but he had yet to work out the methodology. So. Napoleon Hill's vision is to find your specific purpose. You're providing something good to the world. Don't think of failure as an option. And the um, story he tells, Three Feet from Gold, where the guy sold the gold mine and he was three feet from the mother load. Um, don't stop. Don't quit. You know you're going to succeed. So continue because you might just be on the brink of success when you say, okay, I'm quitting. Well, or die trying. <laughs> and if you notice, behind me is Thomas Edison. He is there in my office. He's been keeping me company in my office for decades. And the reason why is because Thomas Edison redefined the notion of failure. And he was the person who established an innovation factory. And more people, there is not a, another person on the planet, rather, that has their name on more patents than Thomas Edison. Yeah. He wasn't the guy that did all the work, but he's the one that created all the vision. So that's who he got, that's who got credit for it. So that's, uh, that's why Thomas is back there. Well, and, and he, he framed failure. Has more failures than successes as well. Well, sure. And how are we keeping score? We're keeping score by what works. And he said, inventing the light bulb, I found 9,999 things that didn't work. Mm-hmm. And so, so in that picture, he's actually hanging on to the one that did. You know, there yeah, are light bulbs the bulb in his hand there. In his house in Fort Myers, there are light bulbs he made that are still burning. Indeed. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. 
Yep. It's so crazy. Hey, let's talk about the difference between a, a leader and a manager. Yes, please do. Because I think that will help people really understand the difference. So a leader sets the standards and a manager maintains the standards. Oh. Huh. A leader provides inspiration, which is tapping into a person's inner goals and bringing them out. Inspiration is always about tapping into that inner person versus motivation is about an external goal. So versus, yep. In Covey's work, he talks about leaders lead people, managers manage things. You manage money, you manage time, you manage schedules, you lead people. Does that, that fit into your mold? I think that's true. I, I think that's absolutely true, although a lot of organizations look at managers as managing people. And I think that there, there's probably something in the middle there that makes sense. Because there's there are a lot of people out there that don't want to be led. Well, and there are, you're right, there are, uh, just tell me what to do. Right. <laughs> they just want to be directed. So while a leader provides inspiration, a manager provides oversight. And so that's in alignment with what you were just saying, oversight. Well, and you think of the college graduate programs are called management programs. Mm -hmm. and, and really, that's, to me, that's where academia is a disconnect with reality. <laughs> So I think yeah. you're, you're giving a little more color, a little more nuance to those areas. So go back to your premise. The Indeed. Leader well, does yep. what? well, a leader instills confidence and a manager expects outcome. Yeah. Yeah. So a leader, to me, a leader is an influencer that fits into your paradigm there. Well, absolutely. And you, the influencer is designed to extract the best version of the person as they are right now. That's the whole premise behind being a leader. And a leader is going to direct a person to where they've never been before and make them feel confident that they can get there. It's and leadership is, leadership is all about innovation, always. We live in the future. Indeed. Leaders live in the future, which drives a lot of people nuts. You're not pragmatic, you're not practical. Well, you're right, that's not my role. You know, it's interesting, uh, I said we have four and a half or so years of interviews with really great people with really great content. And um, it, most of the time, the, the principles are universal and we line up, even if not the language, but the, the philosophy of it. It just occurred to me, it'd be really great fun one time to get in a great argument with a guest about, no, we don't agree with that. <laughs> so, we, but we actually, where you have points of disagreement, oftentimes, if we're talking to each other, which is leaders or listeners, um, very underutilized skill, in that point of apparent conflict, there's a finite point of truth that we're, we're not capturing if we're not looking at it, you know, with a different dimension. So, I appreciate you um, adding some extra dimensions to the uh, old different definitions I've had because there's it's not this or that it's 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 a nuance and it's a it's an area of 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 definition not a specific definition as far as what I'm hearing today. Well, it's yes and, and the reason why is because we're all creating different fusion different versions of the future which require different methodologies and different approaches. We all lead different characteristics of people, which requires uh, things within context. And going back to your, your comment there about leaders listening, it's about gaining perspective. Leaders gain perspective because they're leading into the future to serve a group of people in a specific way. And they check in on the perspective of the team it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to take the advice of the team, given the fact that the leader is generating the future, whereas the perspective of the team may be more about conservation of the past. Now, there are some leaders, of course, that conservation of the past is their goal, and then they're going to be driving forward with publishing technologies and preservation technologies, but the past preservation is their goal. 
So there, it's all within context. All right, so let me give you a couple more um, uh, ex different customer expectations. And a manager manages customer expectations. So the leader's vision of the future is a marketplace which creates profit. Don't think that you have competition. You're sorely mistaken because your competition is your offering. <laughs> And as long as what you're offering in terms of the return on the donation, the return on time, the outcome that your constituents expect um, is if you're not providing more value than other options, then they're going to go to other options with the, uh, the rare exception that your organization is part of their identity. If you have an identity lock on your constituents, you're way less likely for them to defect for a value purpose, but that, that, that's not helping the Catholic Church any right now. So, so say more about this identity lock. Give me, give me a little more nuance around that. Well, well, Hugh, are you a sports fan? No. Do you know sports fans? Uh, yeah. You know any rabid sports fans? Oh, yeah. I used to live in a town with a football team called Hokies. All right. There's and so... Religion there. So the Hokie religious fans, would they ever wear a rival team's shirt? No way. Only if they lost a big bet. <laughs> Even then, that's pushing. And it'd be a, it'd be a hallmark of embarrassment. Well, you know, a rational, logical human being would root for a sports team that wins more than they lose. Than they lose but we're not rational human beings. We root for the sports team that is the part of our identity. And that identity is established usually when we're young because we went to the games with our parents or our grandparents. Uh, our parents dressed us in the team uh, colors before we even could leave the cradle. This is installed as part of your identity. And people refer to sports teams as their team when there's zero ownership. We won last night. We lost last night. That is identity. And it is so embedded. And when you can embed what you do into a person's identity, you become competition proof. It's going to take a massive um, disappointment or betrayal for them to disconnect their identity from that organization. Mm -hmm. So translate that into your supporters for your nonprofit organization. Well, that becomes easy. That is make it easy for your supporters to in integrate themselves into, integrate you into their daily lives. And that's things like providing a screensaver for their mobile device. My wife is a massive fan of the Vegas Golden Knights. And she has on her telephone a Vegas Golden Knights logo. So when she picks up her phone, she's reminded of her favorite team. Give them uh, articles of clothing to wear. Um, give them um, desktop background give them coffee mugs, give them all kinds of things that will incorporate you and what you're doing into their life. And so the more that you can get them to associate with you, the tighter the relationship. So that also comes with volunteering. So when people volunteer, it becomes part of their lifestyle and therefore part of their identity. And so they're going to tell their friends, I can't Wednesday night because I am fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. It's just, I'm thinking of all the really good nuggets that you've given so far. We're half, well, we're a little past halfway through. Um, and so I've already gotten a new definition of leadership, this thing about identity. Um, so there's lots of good little nuggets here. So this, this whole context of leadership is volunteering. It's, it's very elusive. I, I think I've got a, uh, 
a signal deficit problem. Oh, right. you, am I breaking up? I'm thinking all the really good nuggets that you came on so far. Actually, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, we're getting a little little delay someplace. Uh, with our Facebook feed, somehow it decided it would re rear its head. I thought it was a, a, a technical flaw. I'll cut that out of the recording. Oh, but all is well. It just makes it entertaining. It shows that we're live because we are flaws and all. Um, so I'm just reveling in the, the new, we could call them sound bites, but the new little embedded pieces of wisdom in this, this whole thread. Um, let's take a minute. We're, we're two thirds of the way through here, actually. And um, your website is bija.com. Talk yeah, about that. Bija.com. Bija.com. A bija means seed in Sanskrit. And my belief is that the seeds of greatness are within all of us. We just need to have the food and the water for those seeds to emerge into the greatness that we are. And I think that um, for today's podcast, for today's production here, uh, a, a site that you might find useful, while the Bija site has got 150 blog posts and all kinds of stuff up there on business acumen, uh, something you might consider is going to ondemandu.com. On demand, remember, you, you, it stands for ondemanduniversity.com. And in preparation for today's uh, conversation, I posted a, an hour and a half uh, live event that I did for the University of, Las University of Nevada, Las Vegas, for their, um, for their graduate and PhD students on this topic. And I've posted it up there along with a handout and also the audio track. So you can just download and listen to it like an audio book. So on demand, you, the top of the page, you'll see a, a, a click that says, if you're looking for the leadership course, click here. And when you get to the checkout page, enter into that checkout page, um, lead 101 free. So capital L-E-A-D 101, capital F free, lead 101 free. And that will give you completely free access to that course. So you're going to hear some of the things I've said so far, and you're going to hear a heck of a lot more. <laughs> Is it capital L and capital F? Yep, capital L and capital F. Will, it will, when you enter it into the uh, coupon code, you don't need to put your, your credit card in there. Uh, when you use that coupon code. That will get you access to that, uh, that program. You can see the playback, the handout materials, as well as the audio track if you want to download and listen to it as an independent uh, audio book. And that's it, On Demand You. We'll remind people at the end, we'll put it into the transcription. That's on, it. On, um, on the um, podcast and on the, the YouTube video and on the site where we have this posted. People can find this at the nonprofit exchange.org. The T H E the nonprofit exchange.org. So Mark, we're we're dealing with this 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 topic that's commonly expressed and and very rarely understood, especially mm -hmm. with the dynamics you're sharing today of leadership skills. And you mentioned a lot of styles. Um, you didn't come up with transformational leadership. Which is oh, well, would you like for me to step through the, the styles that I've identified? Sure. And, and right. Center Vision is a champion for transformational because to me, that's the, the revelation of the conductor transforming people as that are instrumentalists or singers into a choir orchestra is, is the fundamental part of transformation. But let's identify because there are styles. I'd love to hear your take on that. Sure. And let me, let me set this up, preface this conversation with um, it depends on the, hor the style that's required it is dependent on the organization's time horizon. Are they focused on short-term issues or long-term issues? It depends on the organization's capital priorities. Are we team capital focused or are we systems capital focused? Mm -hmm. It depends on the organization's goal focus. Is it a team goal or a constituent goal versus an organizational goal? Is it the individual goals that we're attempting to manage or the organization's overall goals? It depends on the organization's outcome focus. Is the organization about tactical or accomplishing a task? Or is it focused on strategic, accomplishing a mission? It depends on the leader's value 
does it come from coaching or consulting? So coaching is diagnostic where we bring people into their own conclusions through experienced inquiry and we install new critical thinking skills versus consulting, which is prescriptive. It brings expertise, opinions, and solutions to achieve a specific biz valued outcome. So the, the leader could be more coaching style or it could be more consulting style. And then leadership style ultimately ranges from low directive to high directive, where low directive leaders don't tell people what to do. High directive leaders tell them exactly what to do. And so let me step through 10 of the styles that I've identified that range from lowest directive to highest directive. There probably is another dynamic that would occur to me. You know, all of those that you've, you've said are certainly correct, but would it also be true where the organization is in its life? Oh, you know? life's, well, yes, yes, absolutely true. Depends on where they are in the life cycle. Are you launching? Are you growing? Are you optimizing? Are you getting ready to close things down? Um, yes, all of those, that life cycle is going to have different demands. Or in, in the case of a nonprofit, I'm a founder. When I'm gone, it'll be my legacy that will run. It's a different leadership style after I'm gone. Indeed, it will. Okay, that's right. All right, so the, uh, the least directive is servant leadership, otherwise known as supportive. Mother Teresa is a really good example of that. It's a people-first mindset. And we get results from personally fulfilled teams. It's culturally respectful and culturally based. And it works best for nonprofits that are religious or volunteer organizations. And the leader is in the background. The leader is the servant supporting them. So I think a good example of that is a minister who is there to uh, look after their flock and responding to their individual needs and their needs in general. Then the next is a laissez-faire, free thinking, hands off, um, think absent parent. And so this person focuses on their own tasks, delegates to everybody else. And so this is really about uh, directing team members with no uh, supervision. This works well if you have highly experienced teams. Just turn them loose. Next is the visionary leader, otherwise known as the charismatic leader. A good example of that is Steve Jobs. This is somebody who drives change through inspiration and influence. It works great with a seasoned team. It's good for fast growing, highly innovative scenarios. Next one is a democratic or participative leader. Great example of that is Jeff Bezos in the early days of Amazon, where he would get everybody's perspective before making a choice. So you get high levels of team satisfaction and participation. Of course, he's gotten too big for this style to work anymore. This works really well for innovative and creative industries that are growing rapidly. And that's a good example of what I was talking about, the different stages. There's different styles for different stages of a company. Right on. Okay. Uh, the next is Coach. And a really great example of that is Mary Kay Ash, who ran Mary Kay Cosmetics. And so this is a person who, who sets clear goals, provides performance feedback, they balance the need of the organization with the need of the team members. And this works best at at-will organizations that have to perform. So this is actually a, a strategy, I think, that can work well for nonprofits. The only challenge with the coaches, it can be extremely time intensive. Next is pace setter. Great example of that is Jack Welsh, the CE of the GE CEO. It's about driving fast results. Boom. So that's about setting high standards, demanding accountability, and you have to work with um, highly motivated teams that are not afraid to work hard. Next style is transformational, structural. This is the one that you are looking for. My, my uh, example of that is Herb, Herb Kelleher, who uh, ran Southwest Airlines. Oh. And Southwest still is the most profitable airline for the longest period of time. And the reason why is because he coached from a new playbook. And that's how I like to describe transformational teams. We coach from a new playbook with a focus on objectives. And it's a, it's a blend of direction, delegation, and coaching. Well, and, and in my world, it's based on the vision, which he was very clear about. And yep. it's leading by the vision. And 
in transformational leadership, exactly what, what they did was they empower leaders within. Indeed. Well, he also picked the team that could do that. Uh, one of my favorites is that uh, Kelleher said, I can teach anyone to, to fly a 737 in six months, but I can't teach them the attitude to get out of the cockpit and move the baggage if that's what it takes to get the plane off the ground. So that's a great example. I define transformational leadership as a culture of leadership. And, and I think they're the primary example. They hire for attitude and they train for skill. That's exactly right. And really well said. And they've not veered from that since they're, they're, they were started. And they're the number one airline out of Las Vegas. <laughs> well, they're also the number one airline and they've never been without profit, even when all the airlines were bleeding. That's right. We're making a profit. Exactly right. And people that fly Southwest are raving fans. All right, I've got three more styles for me and then we'll wrap this up. Next one is transactional. See, we're getting more and more and more directive here. Transactional, Bill Gates, a great example of a transactional leader, CEO of Microsoft, highly structured, performance focused. He uses incentives, which was stock, and punishment, which was demotion if you didn't deliver. So it's a classic leadership style for corporations. It does work well for hitting revenue goals, but it does limit innovation, which does describe Microsoft. All right, the ninth style is autocratic or authoritarian think military general. This is a person who is focused on results, efficiency, and control. They give orders, they expect them to be followed. And this is highly useful if you have an experienced team where a little creativity is needed and you have a critical mission. So that's the list. And we got one more, and that would be the bureaucratic leader. We've already talked about that briefly. Follow the rules and the procedures. There's defined penalties for noncompliance and little or no reward for compliance. And this is what you need for highly regulated organizations and situations. So that's the list. I, and I think probably none of those are pure one thing or the other. There's, there's, They're not. There's They're, within, like in music, you don't play piano, you play within piano. That's right. Or within forte. You're a musician, mm -hmm. you got that. So you, you play within that realm. Uh, it's interesting that transformational leadership is about the influence of the leader in the culture. And um, it was derived from the military because it's about a high performing team. And if you think about it in combat, the general doesn't, doesn't tell people what to do. They're already trained, they've got the, they've got the objective and then their tactics are for reaching that objective. So it's That's interesting right. that that Burns and Bass used the military um, as a model for that. And it, it's certainly the nuances are different. And sometimes people who are not conductors, musical conductors, think that the conductor is a dictator. Uh, but I gotta tell you, you got a bunch of union players and you got a little white stick, you can't make them do anything. <laughs> but you can certainly influence them. The yeah, old you, saying, um, the, the, uh, if the orchestra likes the conductor, they play as the conductor intends. If they don't, they play exactly as the conductor conducts. <laughs> so we, we you talked a little bit about yourself. Um, since I've known you, I've, I've been amazed at the um, multiplicity of skills um, and content. I mean, you're prolific. Thank you. And, and you write a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, and, and everything like our brother, uh, Dr. Gruder, everything yes. you write is exceptional. Thank so, um, one sign of a good leader is you surround yourself with uh, people that are better than you are. Indeed. And like, uh, Russell just sent me a text. He had technical difficulties, so he wasn't on today as co-host. So I got to, I got to do the, the ice cream thing, Hagen das floor. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole thing. Um, so, like Russell said, if you're the smartest person on your team, run like hell, because yeah. uh, you're in trouble now. Um, so, so in uh, I'm going to give a sponsor a moment. Before I do that, um, what aspects of leadership have we not talked about today? Well, we've actually talked about a lot of aspects, just because we only had a, a reasonable amount of time. I think that what I'd like to share with you is what I consider to be the, the steps to, to lead to substantial, meaningful, 
certain results as a leader. And it's, it's really simple. Number one, you're going to agree with all these, my friend, define a clearly measurable objective so that you and your team knows what success looks like, smells like, feels like, tastes like. Number two is provide the resources to accomplish the objective. The human capital, the, the money capital, the time capital, the acumen tech capital, the information capital, the access capital, access to people. Then number three is check for motivational alignment. That's what leaders do really well. Is, is this a person who knows how to accomplish the task, can accomplish the task, wants to accomplish the task, and they see it as contributing to their career path. And we have to have all four of those alignments if we're going to have success with the team. And the place where we have team problem is they don't know how, they can't do it, don't want to do it, or don't see the value in doing it. And so that's the motivational alignment piece. The number four is give them accountability and give them a deadline. All projects must have a deadline. All tasks must have a deadline. And then once you have that set up, then set checkpoints and milestones so you can manage them and so they can manage themselves and they know how they're doing towards the process. And the number six is turn them loose. Get out of their way. Wow. Now we will transcribe this interview and it will be on the webpage in a few days. And then um, before we sign off today, um, we'll repeat the link where people can go mm -hmm. to get the access to the video and the handout. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll share those. Uh, I'm going to do a sponsor moment. And then after we share those, Mark, I want you to think about what's a closing challenge or thought or tip that you would like to leave with the leaders. Right now, I'm going to share my screen. And so if you're, if you're watching on video uh, on Facebook or you're watching the replay as you go to the nonprofitexchange.org, um, you'll be able to see, and I'll post, I'll post uh, a picture on there. But our sponsor is Easy Card, and my, my computer is being slow. It, it, yeah, there we are. Easy Card, the whole thing is it's easy in the letter E and Z. So if you pick up your, your smartphone, and of course Seth Godin says they aren't really smartphones, they're just fast phones. But you pick up your fast phone that's got a texting program, um, it's got to have a screen on it. So, we, uh, so you text this number, 64600. So if you send a text to 64600, and in the message put in the words LDR, that's abbreviated leader, then you'll get a text back that says click on this link. And what you'll get is Center Vision Leadership Foundation in your hand. This is our online community for community builders. You can join this community and you get resources like today's podcast. You'll get the video. After a certain number of weeks, the video is not available uh, for general consumption, even though the podcast is, but the video has all of the, all of the, the tips written out for you that Mark has given you today. But this is about it. There's learning opportunities we have available and uh, lots of different kinds of programs and opportunities. Many are free. And there's different levels of membership. If you join um, for free, you get some resources. $10 a month, it unlocks more resources. And at $40 a month, it unlocks resources like you get um, Nonprofit Performance Magazine. Um, in person, you get it in your hand in print. and um, you know, the computer's slow, but there, it'll show the magazine cover there. You get the videos for the nonprofit exchange. You get office hours every week. So you get live intervention with me and my team, um, questions that are pressing, and there'll be other colleagues of yours around the country. And by the way, the easy card is a way to put a donor link. We have one for the Lynchburg Symphony Orchestra, and you can share this easy card or you can get your own easy card. So there's easy cards for different kinds of industries, but for a, for a nonprofit, it's a way for you to engage your volunteers, engage your board, and to engage your donors as a place where you can um, talk about your sponsors. And here's our sponsors, uh, Easy Card, Word Sprint, uh, United Methodist Church, the Cyber Campus, online learning for clergy, and marketing partners uh, who 
it's helping us ramp up our, our marketing marketing systems. So get your own easy card, but first download the, the Center Vision easy card. E, uh, 64600 is the number and you send the words LDR and then you've got it right in your hand. You could have all your members, all your donors, all your constituents in with you in their hand. So Mark, where can people find this great video that you're giving them today? All right, great. Go to ondemandu.com, O-N-D-E-M-A-N-D -E and the letter U.com. Stands for On Demand University. And if there will be a link at the very top of the page, the when you go the main page is right at this moment offering a a program on how to market to investors to raise money. Uh, but the, there's a there's a link at the very top of the page that says if you're looking for the uh, leadership skills, click here. That'll take you to that description page at the bottom. You can click and it'll take you to where you order. Just enter into the coupon code at the bottom, right above the uh, the credit card, is LEAD101 FREE, capital L LEAD, L-E-A-D, 101, uh, then capital F FREE. And that's the coupon code that will give you access. Don't need a credit card, give you free access. And, and then you also you have lifetime access. So you can get to that anytime you want. And um, all of the content that we've talked about today is in that 90 minute program, including the handouts. So there you go. You can see there's a uh, click here at the very top. That's the place that you go. Describes the, uh, uh, the program at the bottom is a click to where you can enroll. You can enroll and you put that code in there. Yep. If you want to just go ahead and do that, you would take me to the order form at the bottom. Click on that. And, then you, and then, then, and then you put the code somewhere at the very bottom. It says "Have a coupon," and you can click in that "Have a coupon" on that "Have a coupon" link right above "Select Payment Method." Yes, there it is. And then you can type in "Lead 101" capital L. 101 free capital F. There it is. And then when you click sign up, uh, then it'll give it to you. Now it'll ask you for your it's going to want to, I want to know who you are. So I'm going to, I'm going to gather some information. I'm going to have a conversation with you. Oh, by the way, this, when you enroll, this gives you access to 20 minutes of conversation with me at no additional charge. Love it. So Mark, we're at the top of the hour. It's been so helpful. A lot of thank you. Hugh. This. What, what do you want to leave people with today? Well, I think the key thing to remember is simply this, that as a leader, you are creating a new vision of the future. And if you're willing to take on the uncertainty of heading into the future where you are not at all knowing how you're going to accomplish what you have in mind, then you have the capacity to be a leader. And if you got to have certainty, if you have to have comfort, uh, then probably leadership's not a good idea for you. There's plenty of room for followers. Mark, thank you for for being on the nonprofit exchange and thanks to all you great leaders who are making a difference in people's lives. Consider joining the community for community builders. The best leaders I work with are always, always transforming their skills to the next level of efficiency. Our organizations can only be as good as we are. So join us because we're all better as we think and work together. So Mark, thanks again. A pleasure. Thanks. And check out the articles that I wrote in the latest uh, performance magazine. In our performance in performance 360, yes, Mark is a contributor there. Thank you for that as well. Uh, Thank you.